Dr. Lantry, Dr. Lantry has been the, sorry, Dr. Lantry has been the, is the curator of the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio since 2000, and he's also the historian uh, for the museum. His curatorial focus includes uh, space and missiles, strategic nuclear deterrence, the First World War, the Korean War, and the Southeast Asia War. Yes. He, reserved his, he received his PhD in the history of technology with a certificate in museum studies from the University of Delaware. He is a U.S. Air Force Reserve historian, and he has uh, served in deployments in both Afghanistan, Iraq, Kuwait, and Qatar. And so it's my pleasure right now to introduce Dr. Doug Lantry. And thank you, Doug, for joining us today. Well, thanks a million, Alan. I appreciate it. Um, I'm happy to be with the group today and to share some uh, history of the Southeast Asia War and especially Operation Homecoming on its 50th anniversary. So uh, before I get started, let me give a quick shout out to my new friend, uh, Larry Benson, who should be out there in the peanut gallery. We've corresponded once or twice, and uh, we're working on trying to get this presentation done uh, locally live as well. So hello, Larry, I'm glad to glad you're out there and, uh, and uh, let's get started here. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, you should all, you should all be seeing the presentation now. Okay, so let's get started. Let me introduce what we're gonna talk about tonight. I'm gonna to, uh, cover a couple of topics related to the war, the prisoners' captivity, their homecoming, and finally, how we remember such things, why we do it, and especially how we do it in museums like the National Museum of the US Air Force. So we'll cover the war in Southeast Asia from an Air Force perspective, but I'll try to, to broaden it out a little bit because, uh, because I'm sure we have representatives from all the services out there in the peanut gallery. I'll describe something about prisons in Southeast Asia and the torture that the prisoners of war endured and their survival, how they did it. I'll cover some interesting facts about Operation Homecoming itself, which turns out to be more than one event. It turns out to be a series of events or a process. Um, so it's, it's an, interesting, an interesting process of getting these people home. I'll cover a little bit about what POW and MIA personnel and their families and the people charged with uh, caring for them and accounting for them, what they have done and achieved after the war. And finally, a word about museums and memory. So let's get started with the war in Southeast Asia. The geographic scope of the war that you can see on the right-hand side of your screen here um, covers a lot of ground, not just South Vietnam and North Vietnam, but also the Gulf of Tonkin, the South China Sea, the Gulf of Thailand, and also Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. That is why we at the National Museum of the US Air Force call it the Southeast Asia War. Uh, the popular name for this conflict is the Vietnam War, but it was so much more than Vietnam, North and South. It covered an awful lot of ground, and to be more accurate in our description, we have called it the Southeast Asia War and the Air Force has um, for more than 20 years now. It, it doesn't, it's not as easy to say as Vietnam, but uh, it's what we call it in writing, even though in conversation, everybody still says the Vietnam War. So the Air Force perspective and the museum perspective is mostly about the air war because that's what we are charged with remembering and preserving. But I want to make certain that as we talk about POWs, it's not just uh, Air Force POWs. Uh, the great majority of the POWs were Air Force combat aviators, 
but many naval aviators and soldiers and Marines and some sailors and even civilians and even foreign personnel were counted among the POWs. So there were, let me move my other screen here a little bit so I can see it. Okay. The prisons in Southeast Asia turned out to mostly be concentrated around the Hanoi area in North Vietnam, as you can see uh, on the map here. Uh, most, as I said, were around Hanoi, but they were, there were several elsewhere, and they had nicknames like Alcatraz, Dirty Bird, The Zoo, The Zoo Annex, Plantation, Briar Patch, Camp Hope, Portholes, Camp Faith, Farnsworth, Skid Row, Dog Patch, Mountain Camp, and Rock Pile. These are all names uh, that the people imprisoned there gave them. There were 802 prisoners of war in Southeast Asia. 661 of those were military, but 141 were civilians or foreign nationals. Most of the uh, almost 500 who were held in North Vietnam were tortured and imprisoned in these several locations that you can see on the map here. However, more than 250 were held in jungle camps in South Vietnam for as long as nine years. 31 were held in Laos, another 31 in Cambodia, and a few in China. So the geography of torture and survival in prisons in the Southeast Asia War was a vast one. Uh, we hear the most about the Hanoi Hilton, uh, a famous place of, of legend and nightmare. But in reality, these camps were spread all over the place and held an awful lot of people. So what are we talking about in, in time scale here? Um, the photos you see here are the famous Hanoi Hilton the Maison Centrale, the, the old French colonial administration building in the middle of Hanoi. You see the entrance there on the left and an interior courtyard of the uh, Hanoi Hilton on the right with the North Vietnamese guards in the middle there. Uh, the period of time we're talking about is 1964 to 1973, about nine years. This period of time was characterized by uh, frankly, shocking brutality, absolutely shocking ill treatment and torture. Uh, the prisoners were treated as criminals in what the North Vietnamese uh, said was an undeclared war. Some background on this, why did they feel like they could get away with torturing prisoners? It's because they claimed that in an undeclared war, the prisoners had no rights according to the Geneva Conventions, which North Vietnam had signed, and were therefore to be treated as criminals. You may note that the Geneva Conventions uh, make no provision for war declared or undeclared. There's no difference. But the North Vietnamese claimed a difference there. And so they said that they were uh, perfectly uh, justified in, in treating our prisoners as criminals. Of the uh, more than 800 who were prisoners, 660 survived the war, 65 died in captivity. And as of today, there are about 1,600 still missing. Uh, the, these are, uh, not all of these were prisoners. These are just missing, missing personnel from the war. So a, a lot of those were never prisoners. They're just, were, were never found. Um, in North Vietnam, not only their military uh, was involved in, in these prison camps, but also civil authorities and the Viet Cong and the Pathet Lao were involved in uh, capturing, brutalizing, and uh, detaining um, American and other P 
POWs. The difference, of course, between the North Vietnamese government and the Viet Cong was that the, the North Vietnamese government was the, the government of North Vietnam, while the Viet Cong were the insurgents or the eventual provisional government of South Vietnam. And the Pathet Lao were uh, communist insurgents in Laos. Uh, in the war as a whole, the POW's return in 1973 represented a bright spot, a, a brief and temporary bright spot, but nonetheless a moment of jubilation in a war that was, as many of you remember, very controversial at home. For the United States military, the learning experience that came out of uh, Southeast Asia um, was an important one. It was a learning experience about the POW's code of conduct and exactly what people could endure under what circumstances. Well, here's some of what they endured. As I mentioned, they endured uh, unbelievable criminal brutality. Uh, the stories of, of this treatment are almost too harrowing to think about. But there are many written accounts by former POWs and documentary films as well. Um, I, I urge those of you with a strong stomach to um, take a look at some of those accounts. They're scary. The drawing that you see here on the right is called the Vietnamese rope trick. Um, imagine having that done to you. These drawings, by the way, are done by a uh, a Navy prisoner of war, um, Mike McGrath. These are the only visual record that we have of the prisoner's treatment over these nine years in uh, North Vietnamese prisons. So the, the Vietnamese rope trick um, is, you, you'll see other pictures like this shortly. That, and the, the person on the left is a prisoner not only injured, but paraded in public. This happened more than once and is directly contrary to the Geneva Conventions. You do not parade prisoners of war in public. And yet they, they did have to endure that. Um, so why, 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 why would they do this? Uh, it's because of a fundamentally different view on their side of human rights. And the communist claim that Americans were capitalist agents bent on destroying their revolutions. In other words, criminals and pirates, not military adversaries. Now you may know, uh, having perhaps talked to some, uh, some Vietnam veterans, especially aviators, um, they sometimes incredibly can joke about being called Yankee air pirates. And some of them have patches that they wore on party suits that said Yankee Air Pirate on it. Uh, I find it absolutely astounding that people can have both the courage and the resilience to joke about being a Yankee Air Pirate. That is really amazing to me. Here we have another drawing about interrogations. They spent hours or sometimes days at a time on their knees or on a small stool, often with their arms up in the air. This is very, very painful after a while. Uh, note the pencil and paper on the desk there in front of this prisoner. Uh, that's for the confession. Of course, the, this came right after the capture period, which you see on the right-hand side here. This is a Hayden Lockhart, the first Air Force prisoner of war. Uh, that was a period of uncertainty. And being captured um, uh, was, was so far out of uh, these combat aviators' experience that all they could do was fall back on their training and fall back on first principles. Don't give away information. Do not betray your colleagues. Stick to the code of conduct. That was pretty much all they could fall back on. And all of that was buttressed by just plain courage, just plain courage. Here are uh, some more of McGrath's drawings. Um, I think uh, barbarism is a good term for the treatments that you see here. 
beaten with hoses, beaten with fan belts, beaten with tire treads, iron bars and filthy rags placed in their mouths to stifle their screams. Uh, the fellow that you see in the middle here is Air Force Captain Edwin Atterbury. He planned an escape that nearly succeeded, but did not, and he was murdered by the North Vietnamese. A recurring theme among former POWs is a long time spent in solitary confinement and in irons. Um, imagine spending time like this for a long time, days, weeks at a time. Uh, the effects of this were terrible skin diseases and, and terrible mental anguish. As I mentioned before, the prisoners were paraded in public. This famous photograph is um, what's called the Hanoi March. It was one of the most egregious abuses by North Vietnamese authorities. And it turned out to be a political stunt that backfired. They paraded these uh, prisoners through Hanoi. It, it took about an hour and they filmed it, but the assembled crowds nearly got out of control and nearly attacked all those POWs. And that would have been on film. And they, they had a hard time controlling those crowds. So far from looking victorious, the North Vietnamese actually um, appeared backward and cruel, which was a true thing. Um, so there, the, the, uh, the PR stunt by parading these guys in, in front of the public uh, definitely did backfire. Of course, it, uh, as I mentioned, didn't all happen in Hanoi. Uh, Makeshift prisons in Laos, Cambodia, and South Vietnam featured conditions that were as bad or even worse than North Vietnamese prisons, principally because there were no buildings in a lot of cases. There were cages like this one. Um, the hallmarks of this kind of captivity were constant exposure to the elements and also constant movement. They were moved from place to place to place. Uh, these prisoners were kept on a very, very poor diet and had little or no medical care. Inside that bargain, they were usually under the guard of Viet Cong or Pathet Lao guerrillas who answered to no central authority. So the guards were, were freelancing and the conditions were absolutely terrible. Um, among the people held outside of North Vietnam, um, 124 were, were returned from South Vietnam, Vietnam, 23 from Cambodia, 13 from Laos, and two from China. So survival. We, we know already that, that the conditions were absolutely terrible. And the key to survival was courage, discipline, and organization. The picture you see here is a picture of a prisoner doing what's called the tap code. The tap code, uh, what you could do was uh, you figure out the alphabet with the, the chart on the right here, and you'd put your drinking cup on the wall so that you could use it as a kind of amplifier, and you would knock on the wall to get someone else's attention. And then you'd tap out a message and they would tap a message back. The POWs had learned this tap code in survival school. And of course, communication was strictly forbidden for several years, but the North Vietnamese were never able to stop these POWs communicating. In fact, not only did they use the tap code, they used what was called the mute code, which was just hand signals that you could make um, uh, when you were too far away or you didn't share a wall or you didn't want to make any noise. And finally, they were able to pass notes sometimes as well. They could write a note and leave it uh, in a sink or in a bar of soap if they had one or 
under a toothbrush or in the bathroom or someplace like that, they would leave notes for other people to pick up. Um, they used mostly drains and uh, waste containers as good places to leave notes because those were places that guards didn't want to put their hands, but prisoners knew something was in there. So they used those. Well, there are stories of torture and survival, as I mentioned, that you, you can read a lot of these stories. One of the most famous stories of endurance that we uh, celebrate in the museum is the story of Lance Saijan. Uh, he's an example of courage, and his individual story stands for all of those who did not return um, from Southeast Asia. He died in captivity following repeated attempts at evasion and escape. And he featured a steadfast refusal to cooperate. Here's how it all happened. He was shot down in November of 1967 and he evaded capture for 46 days with a broken leg, 46 days. Imagine crawling around for 46 days on a broken leg. Well, he was finally captured, but he immediately escaped. He was taken to the Hanoi Hilton and tortured, but he gave no information, according to those who heard him yelling and screaming. Uh, when he was finally done being tortured, he wanted to try to escape again, despite his grave injuries. He was finally removed from his cell and he was never heard from again. He was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor in 1976. And uh, in the bargain, he became the first graduate of the Air Force Academy to receive the Medal of Honor. Um, other POWs who received the Medal of Honor included uh, Air Force Colonel uh, Bud Day, Air Force Colonel Leo Thorsness, Navy Admiral James Stockdale, whose name I'm sure you recognize, and Army Master Sergeant John Caviani, Army E3 William Port, Army Captain Rocky Versace, and Marine Colonel Donald Cook. Uh, Saijan's story stands out for us in the Air Force, but all of those stories of tremendous uh, fortitude are worth uh, finding, reading, and remembering. Well, the uh, the release of POWs at the end of the war wasn't the first attempt to get them out. There was another one. You can read about the Sante raid. Uh, there, there's an exciting paperback published about that raid. Uh, concern about POW's welfare led to um, rescue attempts like this one. This was truly an audacious mission right into the heart of North Vietnam, 23 miles from Hanoi involved a lot of airplanes, a lot of helicopters, and a lot of Air Force Green Berets, all uh, being protected by naval aviators from uh, nearby aircraft carriers. It was a huge joint operation, which unfortunately failed. Um, when these guys managed to get their helicopters into the prison compound, which you can see there on the right in a very detailed practice model that they used for planning. When they managed to get their helicopters into that compound, they found that the prison was empty at Sante. There was nobody there. And so they had no choice but to pack up and leave. But that is not the end of the Sante story. Prisoners in a nearby camp saw the commotion and word spread that uh, there was a rescue attempt. And this was a great morale builder in the prisons. Uh, remember that these guys could communicate with one another even though they weren't supposed to. And the story spread quickly that um, there was a rescue attempt. They care about us. They know we're here. They tried to come get us. So despite the fact that the raid failed, it succeeded. It succeeded morale-wise because the prisoners knew about it. What about the families? What an odyssey for families. Um, 
At first, government policy in this country encouraged families to remain silent about the unknown fate of their husbands in Southeast Asia because it might make negotiation difficult and it might make matters worse for POWs. Uh, North Vietnam was very cagey about all this. They wouldn't release lists. They wouldn't permit communication for the longest time, no letters or packages. Well, after the true conditions in Southeast Asia were revealed by some prisoners who were released as a goodwill, big air quotes around it, goodwill gesture, uh, public sentiment led the government to go public with demands for accountability and better conditions. Wives of prisoners formed the National League of Families of American Prisoners and Missing and Southeast Asia. And their organization came up with the POW symbol and the POW flag. It came from this effort. You can see this group on the Capitol steps and you can see the, uh, the symbol there on the right-hand side. Um, they didn't think that this would get as much sympathy and sentiment and publicity as it did, but that simple design there on a black flag uh, became a symbol that uh, is flown by government rule on a lot of flagpoles now. Uh, you can read all about the story of how that flag was made. And by the way, uh, it's not copyrighted. They want it to be spread far and wide. And so you can fly that flag and use that symbol. So what about Operation Homecoming? When the ceasefire was signed in January, late January of 1973, a plan was put into motion. Now the plan already existed, but it remained to be seen how it would work in actual practice. So on February the 12th, 1973, the first release at Hanoi followed the Paris Peace Accords. Overall, 591 POWs returned from Hanoi and all of those other places. Um, just to, to make a brief accounting of that, that included 325 airmen, 77 soldiers, 138 sailors, 26 Marines, and 25 civilians. Of the more than 800 were, who were POWs, 660 survived the war. The famous picture that you see on the left here are POWs aboard an Air Force C-141A returning or departing Hanoi. Uh, it is said that they were relatively quiet until they left the ground. And then they were not quiet anymore. The photo on the right is a, a Pulitzer Prize winning photo um, uh, taken by, I forget who, uh, oh, it was taken by uh, uh, AP photographer uh, Sal Vader. This photo is called Burst of Joy. I think you get the point. No, ex no further explanation needed there. At the airport in Hanoi, the POWs were turned over to U.S. military control. Their names were checked off against lists and they were released in order of capture. In fact, they demanded to be released in the order that they were captured. That was uh, part of their group mutual agreement as honorable officers and enlisted members. And the North Vietnamese actually tried to give them flashy, colorful suits and ties to wear, but they refused that. And they finally accepted uh, the new clothing that you see here, not ornamented at all, drab, plain, businesslike. Some POWs were not released at Hanoi. Uh, 69 that the Viet Cong held were released at Lac Ninh uh, near Saigon. You can see pictures of that here. So it wasn't all at an airport. It was in a, in a dusty field as well. These things took place in, in a couple of different places. 
the POW release was a major public event. Uh, here on the right-hand side, Colonel Robbie Reisner greets the crowd wearing a brand new uniform featuring his colonel's insignia that he'd never worn before. He was promoted while he was in prison. And the release that we're talking about, this, this whole Operation Homecoming was not just an, a single event, but it was a five-year program to ease their re-entry into American life. The Department of Defense uh, created this multifaceted program to first retrieve the, these POWs, second, to organize them at Clark Air Base in the Philippines, and third, to return them with stops to military hospitals for continuing treatment and uh, a cautious and careful reintegration into society, uh, caring for their mental and physical health at all times and periodically over the following five years. There are some good articles about how that treatment went and how the uh, troops participated, but they were well looked after and the military learned an awful lot about endurance and courage and the code of conduct among prisoners um, from the experience. Here are some prisoners just before release. Um, not much needs to be said about the photo on the right. Those are classic uh, Southeast Asia prisoner clothes. And there's a happy guy on a bus. I'm sure some of you have seen, uh, perhaps own POW bracelets. These were popular things during the war. I had one when I was 10 years old, living on an Air Force base. Um, these bracelets were made and distributed to um, encourage people to remember that there were people being held in terrible conditions uh, while we, uh, the, the rest of us, uh, you know, enjoyed a practically untouched existence in North America while this was happening in Southeast Asia. Here you see on the left, of course, a reunion of an Air Force officer with his family at uh, Travis Air Force Base in California. So I wanna show you a short film now that was uh, made in 2006 that's in our Southeast Asia War Gallery. This really needs no introduction, so I'll just start. They have let all of Hanoi out to watch us come out with our heads down. We marched out in step with our heads high. We actually managed to pull off a column right and halt right at the bus. It was pretty impressive. First of all, I was so emotionally drained. I could have so many expectations in the past, and so many disappointments and failures, so many close friends you lost, people that you lived with that you didn't want to learn, you never saw them again. You became cold. You developed a shield that was for protection so that you wouldn't let your emotions run away. See this beautiful C 141, an American plane at close range with an American flag on the US Air Force, and American uh, military uniform personnel 50 or 100 yards from me. You don't know the feeling it gave me, I'm sure everybody else. You know, fighter pilots have uh, a tendency to look down their nose at cargo plane pilots, but this was beautiful. And Red Cross and American. Air Force on it. I said, oh, I guess we, we really are going to go. So they took us off the bus line and stuff. And, you know, we had a demarcation line, the three went across the line. You still there as it's over here and you belong to the U.S. when you get back. Thank you. 
And as luck would have it, when I stepped across the line and stuck my hand out, there was an old friend there to greet me. I saluted and I kept a very stern military face and I refused to let myself smile until I rounded the corner and went up the ramp into the C-141. And then the smile broke out and then inside we were all hugging, and not hugging, but guys don't hug, <laughs> girls hug. But uh, we were all just, you know, shaking hands and talking with the Air Force personnel. Then it was quiet again as we took off and rolled down the runway and everybody real silent. And as the wheels broke the ground, we just went into Panama. They almost tore the guts out of that airplane. You know, heard such shouting and stomping going on. Here our first significant proof that we're afraid. We're on an American airplane where I'm born now. I had no idea there was going to be anything like the media attention that was given to the Savannah Park and the buildup and the anticipation on part of the public health. So when I met Admiral Dyler and he took me to the microphone and said, do you, do you want to say anything? I said, well, yeah, I've got questions. And I said, the sentences, and then the God bless America just serve our country under difficult circumstances. We are profoundly grateful to our commander in chief and to our nation for this day. God bless America. God bless America. So, you get a taste of, uh, of what that event was like for the people involved. But efforts to uh, locate the missing and care for former POWs, of course, continued after the war. Uh, the Defense POW and MIA Accounting Agency is in charge now of those efforts. The picture that you see on the left there is an aircraft crash site excavation. Um, that is someplace in Vietnam. I'm not sure whether that's North or South Vietnam. I think that's in South Vietnam. Um, but uh, as of today, you saw that the film was from 2006. The, the, the Chiron needs an update there. As of today, um, around uh, 1,000, 
581 individuals remain unaccounted for in Southeast Asia. That is um, not just POWs, but uh, total, everybody. Um, and those numbers that you see on the screen there are a snapshot from yesterday. So that is current numbers from the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. Uh, over the years, they have negotiated the return of more than a thousand sets of remains, uh, which are, are carried back home in a very dignified manner. And uh, they continue their work. Um, that work has not been without controversy. Uh, over the years, efforts to locate the missing and uh, uh, the, the, the unaccounted for in Southeast Asia have been variously successful and unsuccessful and managed well and also mismanaged. Uh, some organizations went defunct and were eventually combined into one macro organization for the DOD which is now doing a much better and faster job of accounting for those who are still missing. Um, to begin with, uh, there were more than 2,600 total missing. And so uh, they're uh, a little more than, than halfway there uh, of accounting for everybody. During the war, as we know, the POWs uh, organized themselves. They called themselves the Fourth Allied POW Wing. Why fourth? Well, it was the fourth conflict in which Americans had been held as prisoners overseas. So they thought, well, we're the fourth wing. So they organized themselves in secret, of course. And uh, for our part here locally at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, one of our uh, local heroes, General Ed Meckenbeyer, was a POW who returned to service, returned to his flying career, as many did, and uh, eventually uh, became a two-star general. Well, he also enthusiastically participated in flights to repatriate the remains of, um, of the missing found in Southeast Asia. So you can see uh, on their on their uh, logo here, their motto is return with honor, and he's emphasizing return. That's Ed Meckenbeyer there, emphasizing the word return. And there he is on the right in the cockpit of the C-141 that first brought prisoners from Hanoi, uh, the Hanoi taxi. Uh, uh, he helped fly that airplane back and forth to get other sets of remains. So there is continuing connection, continuing heritage between past and present. Museums and memory, as, as a final note, how, how do we commemorate this? How do we remember this? This is 50 years ago now. This is 50 years ago. And soon this generation of warriors will be as old as the warriors of Korea and the Second World War because time just keeps on marching. So how do we remember this in the National Museum of the US Air Force? Well, here you see a big mural that we have on display. The little silhouettes there uh, on the right show you about how big this mural is. That mural is an introduction. You go around the corner and there's more exhibit. Our museum features the Hanoi taxi the first airplane that brought prisoners uh, home from Hanoi. We got this airplane in 2006, and of course it had been in service from the 1970s all the way to 2006, and the airplane had changed a lot. It's about 20 feet longer now than it was. Uh, it features a lot of modern new avionics and refueling gear and so on and so on. But it's still the same airplane. And as a matter of fact, it remained the only airplane in the Air Force painted like you see it there with a white top. It was the last white top in the whole Air Force. And that, of course, is because of, of what it did. You can see a picture on the right there. That is the same tail in March 1973. 
Looks a little different now, but same tail number. You can see this airplane in our global reach gallery because it's too big to fit in the Southeast Asia gallery. But because it's in a it's in a huge building, that means you can go inside the airplane, which you see on the right here. You can go up and down that airplane and at the far end of it, you can see how the seats were configured for passengers, especially POWs. And you can see where many, many, many people signed the airplane. They wrote their names on it, as in Kilroy was here. And those signatures are still there. And of course, they're protected um, uh, by plexiglass and so on. So we keep the airplane in pristine condition, but we do allow people to walk in and out of it. Our POW exhibit within the um, 60,000 square foot Southeast Asia gallery. That's right, 60,000 square feet. <laughs> That's, it's a big gallery. Um, the POW exhibit features some of the clothing that the POWs wore, some of the clothing that you see. You see the fellow lighting the guy's cigarette on the right there? Um, his flight suit is folded up right next to him. The same hat, uh, same jacket and everything. Um, so we have, we have heritage artifacts from those days. We also have things that the prisoners made and used while they were in prison, including uh, uh, language and culture and history instruction books that they made for each other to keep their minds healthy. So anybody who knew anything about anything made a textbook for everyone to use. And that is what kept them sharp during their captivity. We have also recreated uh, terrifying things. We have recreated three of the cells from the Hanoi Hilton. And we did this in a very exacting manner, not only with photographs and uh, in-person uh, eyewitness measurements, but we did it with the help of POWs who actually had the courage to go into the exhibit, lay down in the cell, and tell us, yeah, that's about right. That, that feels about right. It's the right color. It's the right size. It's terrifying. I can't believe they actually agreed, especially Ed Meckenbeyer. He agreed to go in there and sit down and tell us whether it felt right. That, to me, is still amazing. You know, these many years later, that was in about 2007. Um, I'm still amazed that he agreed to help us with that. So, Having said all that, that is how we keep this story alive 50 years later. And before that, of course, you know, I, I tried to cover some of the principal facts about the operation, the context, the war, the people, their treatment, and, uh, and our memory of them up until today, which we are engaged in right now. What we're all doing right now is an act of heritage remembrance. That's, that's what we're all doing here. The value of this is that we get to share stories and appreciate other people's courage. So hopefully, um, if we ever need courage like that, we'll have a, a ready source for it. So with that, I will hush and... Uh, Turn it back over to Jacqueline for questions. Thank you, Doug. That was a wonderful presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed that as much as I did. We will now be taking questions from our virtual audience. So if you have them, please enter them into the chat room and I will be sure to ask. I have one just to kind of get off to us a start. Um, you mentioned that we are still doing negotiation efforts to get some of the MIAs back, whether it's their remains or, or help with the search. What do those negotiations look like and what are the challenges that come behind them? Well, the negotiations are, are um, you know, the, the standard international thing that our government does with foreign governments. It involves um, what is necessary, diplomacy, tact, patience, expertise from a lot of different areas, and also they they must battle time the environment there is not conducive to preserving remains at crash sites for a long long time and so it, it is becoming more and more rare that uh, that remains can be found and identified 
Um, sometimes the, they'll, they'll do a dig with archeologists and forensic people and so on. And once in a while, uh, we here at the National Museum of the US Air Force will be contacted by, um, by the DPAA to help identify crash sites. In other words, they will show us a piece of equipment, a buckle or a panel or some piece of metal or fabric or something. And we get to help identify what that is from what kind of airplane did it come because we have the technical orders and so on to help identify those things. And if we can help them put two and two together about what airplane crashed where and who was on it, they can uh, put those numbers and facts together to perhaps identify any remains that they find there. So we feel privileged whenever DPAA comes to us and says, okay, we have a piece of wreckage. It's in this geographic coordinate. What airplane crashed there? What, what was supposed to be flying there on this date? And what is this nut and bolt from? That's where we can help and anything we can do to help push that ball down the field, we're uh, privileged to do. So uh, long answer to a short question, but a very good question. No, that's great. You also mentioned that there was a five-year program that the United States military uh, put together to help with the re-entry of POWs back into society. What did that look like? Well, um, once they got the prisoners back to uh, Clark Air Base, they they all got to go to the PX, or the, well, in, it was an Air Force base, so it was the BX. They got to go to the BX for the first time in seven or eight years. They all got new uniforms and, and uh, basic uh, medical care and checkout. Now, once they got on to uh, their destinations in in uh, in North America, they went to more than thirty different military hospitals for further treatment. And once they were well enough to be uh, rejoined with uh, the public and their families and so on. The government kept up with them at least annually with um, questionnaires and surveys about their mental and physical recovery from the experience. This is where we began to learn a lot about PTSD and so on. And in the beginning, each one of these returned POWs had a chaperone who was assigned to look out for them to protect them from negative interaction because despite the fact that this was a joyous return, our nation was fractured regarding this war. And so, and these guys had missed a lot of change. You know, some things they missed were Robert Kennedy's assassination, Martin Luther King's assassination. They missed people walking on the moon for the first time. This was all news to them. And so they needed, uh, for a short while anyway, to be kind of insulated from, from the, the modern jostling of, of a new world that they might not recognize. And most of them, uh, as the story is told, kept up with the questionnaires and the the evaluations um, for five years. And although some did drop out, um, the ones who were most resilient tended to be um, older officers with family because they had things like that to focus on during captivity. Younger enlisted family, uh, enlisted members without family who did not plan on a full military career appeared to do somewhat worse um, in terms of their uh, their mental well-being. They were they were more adversely affected by torture. Um, but uh, long story short, the five-year program was aimed at both helping return POWs and also learning from them. Thank you. You also mentioned that uh, many of the POWs returned to continue their military career. What did that look like and how do you think their experience in these torturous camps influenced the rest of their time in the military? Those are good questions. I think um, 
what, what we know about the fourth allied POW wing is that uh, one of their mottos is uh, the phrase threes in, threes in. What that refers to is if, if you put, put your right hand out in front of you and you see four fingers and imagine each fingertip is an airplane flying along straight and level. The ring finger pulls up and away. The ring finger is the prisoner. And that would be number three. Well, the phrase threes in uh, basically means that they're back. And so the military aviators who continued in the military mostly returned to flight status and went on to successful careers with promotions. A good example is Ed Meckenbeyer, our, our local POW hero, became a two-star general and continued to fly. And the value of these people to the rest of the force and, and their experience is that not only did they live to tell the tale, they actually embody many of the values that the Air Force and the other services try to instill in their younger members. And so these are living examples of courage, tenacity, resilience, honor, all of those things. And the fact that many of them returned to service and went on to um, uh, brilliant uh, further careers uh, is proof that the code of conduct worked and that their dependence on their inner strength and on one another also worked. So the value is they are living examples for other people. And we're glad that they stayed in service because we there's still many of them around uh, that, that can talk to this group or another group and explain, yes, I did live through that and here's how I did it. Absolutely. Of those that were rescued in Southeast Asia, who was the oldest POW and who was the youngest or what are the age ranges? Oh my goodness. Uh, I think some of the youngest POWs were enlisted members around the age of 20 or 22. Uh, and some of the oldest were senior aviators. In fact, uh, who was it? Hayden Lockhart, who's the first Air Force POW. Um, these senior aviators uh, were probably um, in their, some of them in their late 30s, early 40s, add seven to nine years to that. So you get people um, uh, knocking on 50 years old coming back from that. Um, you saw the people who were repatriated, you saw Admiral Stockdale in the film there. Um, now, a lot of these people looked 10 years older than they really were when they came out of those prisons. And I'm sure they instantly looked younger after a couple of weeks. Um, but uh, that experience will age anybody. But their actual chronological ages probably ranged from the early 20s um, to almost 50. Thank you. Another one, uh, any information about an EC-47Q airplane that shut down in Laos on February 5th, 1973, between the signing of the peace accord and the prisoner exchange? The VFW has referenced this in one of their publications. I'm afraid I don't know about that one off the top of my head, but um, I find the subject interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, for one, an EC-47 is an interesting kind of black world mission because that's an electronic uh, either gathering or disseminating airplane. And so it's not your average combat aircraft, probably unarmed, either collecting signals or um, jamming them. And the fact that it was uh, downed over Laos is another interesting fact because the war in Laos was unacknowledged for a long time. And so that would make that crash, and especially the time period between the negotiation and release, the time period makes that especially curious. Um, so whether or not that crash site was found and whether anybody survived, I don't know the story of that one, but um, I, it's interesting. And I'm kind of making a mental note um, EC-47 Laos late in the war. I need to go look that up. <laughs> Thank you. 
Another question is, were there any war crimes brought against anyone for the mistreatment of the POWs? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I'm not certain of that, but um, when the United States exited Southeast Asia, um, it was a solid hard exit by 1975. And so uh, the, the North Vietnamese, of course, rolled over South Vietnam and our former allies uh, were uh, ejected and, and the whole country um, uh, became communist ruled. So we didn't have any jurisdiction over you know, actually going there and, and grabbing people and prosecuting them. On the flip side of that coin, there have been some well-publicized uh, instances of former American service people going to either South Vietnam or North Vietnam and meeting people who were once their adversaries and essentially burying the hatchet. They needed to go back and be in that place and meet those people and close that loop. And um, you can find stories of that kind of reconciliation, which I think is heartening uh, because it was such a controversial conflict with so many facets and so many, uh, so many arguments and circumstances and so much going on that the, the people who fought that conflict were in a tough spot, a very tough spot um, as to what they were doing, why they were doing it, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And any closure that they can find, any peace that they can find, um, more power to them. If they have to go back there to experience that closure, then I hope they get to do it. Um, other people are less uh, willing to think about it and go back there and don't ever wanna think about it again. I think it probably goes the whole spectrum from one to the other. But to back to the question, um, I don't know of any war crimes trials that were conducted against um, North Vietnamese personnel. But well, then again, I haven't studied you. that part, so I may well, I might learn something on that one. We'll have to do some extra research there. Well, thank you again, Dr. Lantry, for your presentation today. It was wonderful to hear from you. And, and on the 50th anniversary of Operation Homecoming, thank you for your time today and for sharing your wealth of knowledge on that. Also wanna thank all of our Mighty Mo members that are out there online supporting us. Thank you for your continued support of the Battleship Missouri. If you enjoyed this and are not a member, we do offer this programming free for all of our members. So here's some information on where you can become members with our organization and attend future Mojo events. Um, additional ways to follow us, we do partner with Old Salt Coffee Company uh, for this series. If you ever are in need of some extra Joe, please consider them for your next uh, coffee purchase. And thank you all for joining us. This was recorded and we can make it available to you at your request. We appreciate your time today and thank you for joining us. Aloha.